Our theme this year is nature and it's Arlington's historical perspective. Well, what could be more about nature than Native Americans? They revered nature, it was their religion, they respected it, uh, the, everything was important to them that had to do with nature. And then of course, us white guys came along and our goal was to conquer nature. And I think what we, with all of our environmental efforts, we're trying to get back to the fact that we respect nature. So uh, what I would like to do now is to introduce Heather Lavelle, who is the director of the Dallin Museum, and she will in turn uh, uh, introduce our speakers. And thanks again for coming. Yeah, thank you so much for coming, everybody. And it's Native American Heritage Month, and it's great to be able to have this space to celebrate. Um, thank you to the Arlington Historical for co-sponsoring this program with us. And I want to thank Alan and Ferris for being here and sharing your important work with us tonight. Um, one of the missions of the Dallin Museum is to look at Cyrus Dallin's uh, values and his art and ways in which um, those things inspire us to think about our histories, our shared histories, and our shared experiences in different ways. And Dallin valued justice. He valued equity. He had two purposes for his monotony hunter statue. One was to um, serve as a, m a memorial for Winfield Robbins, who was a benefactor of the town of Arlington. And the other was to pay tribute to Arlington's first people. And as many of you know, Dallin was extremely disturbed by the way Native peoples were treated by the United States government. And he experienced that firsthand growing up among the Ute in the 1860s and 70s. And he used that outrage. That was kind of what drove him to create art that um, honored Native people and humanized them and also is what drove him to work collaboratively with Native and non-Native groups on reforms to oppressive policies um, against Native Americans. And I think if Dallin were alive today, he might think we have some work to do uh, still. And another reason why it's important that we're here and um, learning more about the indigenous experience of this land. And so I would just like to say a couple of words about our presenters today. So Ellen Berkland, she is a staff archaeologist for the Mass Department of Conservation and Recreation. She served as the Boston City archaeologist for 15 years, and prior to that, worked on most of the Big Dig archaeological campaigns. Ellen is dedicated to educating DCR staff and the public on the peopling, land use, and history, land use history and fragility of our non-renewable cultural resources. And she's currently administering two federal grants that will document and protect the critical resources on three DCR managed islands. And then Ferris, Strong Medicine Gray, is the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. He's also a tribal council member and a director of the Massachusetts Tribes Board of Directors. And for the last 25 years, Ferris has been a tribal historian, a researcher, and a public speaker. Presently, Ferris fights for the protection of lands that are scheduled for development and protecting undeveloped lands and all the life that call these places home is one of his passions. So before uh, Alan speaks, we're going to have um, Ren Gray, the Sockum, the medicine Sockum of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog, say a brief prayer or a brief couple of words. Down. Pretty good. So um, we uh, would like to bring greetings from the Massachusetts tribe, um, past and present, because we are here in a territory that was led by Grand Sockam Nanny Pashaman. I would like to bring you greetings from that ancestor, Grand Sakam Nanny Pashamit. His wife recorded only a squaw Sakam, or a queen of the Massachusetts, who ruled and is said 
until the sun reached their majority. The sons of Nana Passionate on the High Queen, Sagamore John by the English, Sagamore James by the English, who went appointed, Sagamore James by the English, had their father's territory divided between them. All of these rulers of the northern Massachusetts have stories. Of the three, only one of Quinkin survived to adulthood, early adulthood, leaving him the sole ruler of northern Massachusetts territories. He had a very interesting story, and one day we hope to share it with you. Both the Squasacum in Winnipeg ended up at the Natick praying town, praying town of Natick, living out their last days there. So we also bring you greetings from the southern Massachusetts, the Neponset territorial Sakum, Grand Sakum Chikatabit, who ruled the Massachusetts Territory from what is now Boston all the way down to the Cape, where the Nosset Territory began, to the south southeast and all the way to the west, to central Mass, Worcester, where Nipmuc Territory began. Chikatabit was the principal ruler of the Massachusetts tribe when the English first settled in Massachusetts, for his kinsman, Nanny Pashamit, had passed away. He had much interaction with the English and signed treaties with both Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay colonies before he died in 1933 of smalltalks. Sachem Shamakin, brother of Chickatabit, ruled the Neponset and the minority of Chickatabit's son, Wampatuck. It was under Kutchakapshamakin that John Elliott first preached the gospel to the Neponsets. It was also under his rule that the band of Neponsets were forced from the ancestral lands over, to the, blue, over the Blue Hills to Ponkapog. It was during their first years at Ponkapog that John Elliott worked with the praying villages of Ponkapog and Natick to write the first Bible ever written in the United States or in any of the colonies. And it was written in the Massachusetts dialect of the Algonquin language. I will bring you greetings also from our current tribe, the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog, our Grand Sockham, Bill Solomon, myself, greetings, and our Sagamore, Ferris, Brett, and the members, the many, many members of the Massachusetts at Ponkapog tribe. We are glad to greet you and hope that you find the talks by Ellen and by Ferris interesting. Good evening. Do we want to t hit the lights a little bit or should I just jump in? Okay. Thank you all for coming. Happy Native American History Month. Uh, the Commonwealth cele celebrates it every November uh, following Archaeology Month, which is October. So I hope you got a chance to go to some of our wonderful events. Um, this beautiful depiction is done by Robert Peters Jr., who did this for a DCR signage along the Neponset. It depicts um, a fish weir uh, in use, and I'm going to be showing a little bit more of that fishing technology later on. Uh, that uh, use of fish weirs came about around 5,300 years ago, and they ceased being used when these shoreline stabilized 3,500 years ago. 
So I am charged with, I have less than 25 minutes to talk about uh, the 12,000 year uh, peopling of uh, <laughs> New England. So it's giddy up time. Um, the, where, oh, I see, okay. No, did it go? Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Nope. Woohoo. Yeah, it was working when we tested it. So the um, peopling of New England has everything to do with the environment, of course. Um, it's working on the computer screen. Um, so that's okay. I, I think I have this memorized. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the peopling of New England has everything to do with the environment. Between 18,000 years ago and uh, 14,000 years ago, of course, it was a gigantic hunk of ice, a um, mile to two miles thick, right over us. Uh, and as that glacier retreated, um, if you want to actually change it, that'd be great. Uh, it created a corridor uh, into this general area. So, um, all right, <laughs> I'll act it out. <laughs> so here's the glacier. No. So um, the glacier retreated to the north. It opened up a wide corridor. And um, uh, of course, megafauna started coming into the area. Uh, it was a tundra-like environment, very dry, cold, uh, 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 brush vegetation. And uh, soon after, people came into the area following the megafauna. Um, those first people, Archaeologists refer to as Paleo Indians, Paleo for ancient. We don't know what they called each other. They traveled up from the southwest, oh, in small bands, um, family bands. Uh, they were settled near large glacial lakes or Lake Etz, and they m we don't know much about their social structure or their movement. There are a number of Paleo Indian sites that have been excavated here in the Commonwealth, um, uh, but we find um, a lot of these sites along, as I mentioned, glacial uh, lakes. They would have been probably winter encampments, uh, and they would have traveled in small bands to head out hunting. Um, we don't, um, they follow the uh, megafauna up north, and we don't know how they're related to the next group of people that came in shortly after. Archaeologists refer to them as the archaic people. And that time, or yeah, again, I'm sure they had names. Um, <laughs> between 9,000 and 3,000 years BP, before present, we use that term, before present, um, representing approximately 1950 when radiocarbon, okay, great. So the Boston Basin, this was the perfect place to settle. I call this the Whole Foods of like North America. Um, <laughs> it's an estuary, if you think about it, uh, this shallow area. And this is, um, it's surrounded by this vol uh, 600 million year old volcanoes to the north, creating this really nice shell with this estuary, which is simply what the Boston Basin is. Um, this is showing the outline, and here you can see uh, Boston Harbor and the various rivers that come into it. So this, um, when I refer to the Boston Basin, this is what I'm talking about. Uh, the first people, you met them, I spoke a little bit about them a, a while ago. Um, and this is an example of one of the stone tools. Many of them were mostly exotic materials. When I say exotic, I mean they were coming in from New York, Pennsylvania, Maine. And here's actually an example that was excavated by one of our student conservation interns uh, in one of our state forests. So you can uh, please pass it around. It's uh, blunt, but it is um, exotic, and it's probably 8,000 8, to 10,000 years old. So um, the archaic people, um, again, uh, the climate's changing dramatically, deciduous forests coming up, uh, dropping new nuts. Uh, we get new animals coming into the area, the sea level's gradually rising, uh, we're getting anadromous fish runs, we, um, and we get all sorts of new fishing and hunting uh, technologies. 
First evidence of religious belief, evidence of fire, use of red ochre, which is a hematite or mineral, local mineral here in the area, uh, and grave goods. So and towards the late archaic period, it's broken down into three periods, but again, I have now I have like 15 minutes. Um, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those technologies. We have a whole new climate. Um, uh, we have new technologies, uh, more of a focus on maritime resources, uh, with anadromous runs taking place, um, their uh, seasonality, uh, fish spawns, fish runs um, are, are quite the um, focus for these people. And uh, use of um, marine resources, they're creating boats. This is a machoon, a photograph of a machoon that's submerged in one of the lakes here in Massachusetts. You can see the rocks in it. Uh, to prevent injury from uh, freeze and thaw during the winter, uh, the, the groups would actually submerge them with rocks uh, in the late fall and dive down in the spring and bring them up. And um, of course, uh, there are a number of them that uh, never were retrieved. Uh, fishing technology, I mentioned the fish weir. I uh, hope you've all attended Ross Miller's um, ancient fish weir project on the Boston Common every June. Uh, in estuaries, fish weirs were pretty much uh, wooden uh, fences interlaced with other brush that was collected during the winter, and they were placed along the estuary working with the tides. Uh, the larger fish would chase the bait fish in on the incoming tide, and they would actually swim right over the, the fish weir and get trapped behind it. So um, it's estimated that uh, upwards of 100,000 fish in a two-tide cycle could be taken out of one of our large rivers. And on the left is a piece of a fish stick that was brought over to the city archaeology lab that was recovered by a lawyer in the 1930s. Um, ground stool technology, uh, tool technology comes around during the uh, archaic period. And uh, the, the stone tool that I sent around was used by um, striking it with another rock, percussion, hitting it, making, creating those sharp edges, or sometimes what we call a biface, working on both sides. Ground stone tool technology is abrading a stone um, to create a shape. So I'll send this around. The, the wood isn't the actual wood. Um, the, the stone tool is actual. Um, and technology, atlatl hunting. Atlatl was a, another technology that, that was developed sort of like a, um, a dog chuck it, uh, one of those tools that you use to play with your dogs. Um, you put these spears on the end of um, an atlatl, uh, sort of this handle, this device that was weighted with one of these um, beautiful de decorative uh, whale tail weights that would uh, create more pressure. And it's, uh, it was great for hunting large uh, animals. And it's estimated that the, uh, it was about 600 pounds per square inch was the force of the use of the atlatl. So this was quite the handy. Whaling, there was a lot of whaling taking place. And here in the Boston Basin, and the evidence we found at a Caddy Park site right by Chickatobbit's, one of Chickatobbit's summer seats out in Quincy, and we're hoping to put it on display uh, for the Massachusetts, and you can see it's a flensing kit that was found. This is a what we're calling a sacred site. Uh, Wren interpreted it for me by looking at the artifact, the top artifact, which is a whale tail pendant that was the only broken artifact in a cache of 234 beautifully created, polished, untouched, unused artifacts that were found in this collection in Quincy. And Wren interpreted it as uh, a cenotaph, an offering, uh, breaking uh, the artifact that belonged to someone representing their death. So you can see the net weights on the left, and you can see the flensing kit on the right, and you can see a whale tail effigy. Uh, this was actually the feature that was excavated in Caddy Park, uh, an archaic feature, and again, it was covered with uh, red ochre, hematite, which a uh, metaphor for use uh, oftentimes in rituals to represent blood. And um, you can see the different caches that were found, all associated with uh, whaling. It must have at one point been covered with a... Uh, uh, organic net, organic materials don't survive well in New England because of the acidic soil, so we don't often get organic materials, indigenous organic materials, unless it's in a certain context. But um, the, we believe the net was placed there because we found the net weights, weights circling the entire feature. 
And here, close up, there's the whale effigy on your bottom right. The flensing kit, which is a tool for flensing uh, whales, is at the top. Art. Uh, we have a lot of rock art. And we have a lot of um, uh, art uh, creations here, um, artifacts that are just beautiful effigies. Um, we have in, uh, different collections. Uh, the bottom left is Dighton Rock. It's a 3D image, a 3D scan that we just recently had done. Uh, and the next period, uh, 3,000 years to 4,500 years before, is referred to as a woodland uh, period. And at this point, the shoreline has stabilized, and everything's pretty much focused on uh, the maritime resources. People begin to settle uh, and work the land. Uh, cultivation, horticulture began in the um, or late archaic, uh, but we uh, see lots of it um, during this time period. Widespread use of ceramics as well. They had to store their food and cook their food. Uh, and we find, as a result of that focus on maritime uh, life, we find shell middens. Um, most of these uh, we have found on the um, harbor islands, and they're pretty much located in the southeast portions, uh, which would have been associated with the beds, the shell beds themselves. But also, uh, they were placed um, downwind of the actual sites that were out there, because, of course, you wouldn't want to uh, be, <laughs> be upwind of any of the, the results of these thousands of years of thousands of clam bakes. Um, so um, some of them in the Pacific Northwest are the size of football fields. They're quite huge. But archaeologists love them because they're sort of like our um, indigenous privy. They would throw everything in here. And the preservation is amazing. Uh, the organic artifacts that we pull out of them are uh, quite impressive. I'll show you some of those. Um, there were multiple, there were many, many shell middens along the larger rivers here in the Boston area, but they were used um, as raw material for liming industries uh, in the 17, 18, 1900. So most of those are wiped out. There were a number of studies, actually from some of the first um, archaeological studies that are still used today were of the shell middens that were done along the riverways. So how do we know uh, how a, a tool was used, uh, when it was used, and how old it is? Well, context is everything, but we have a, a system here in New England a diagnostic system where we have the different uh, shapes and forms that um, have been cataloged and associated with a certain certain time period. That's the briefest definition I can give you. But these are some of the bone artifacts that were just magnificent coming out. Uh, these are some simple bone awls on your left. Uh, and the bone bar points, they were used on fishing spears um, uh, out in the harbor, and those are all made of deer leg bones. I should have, you know what, I should have, I, I'm sorry, I'm in your way. Um, some of the other artifacts that came out are just high representation of many different mammals, fishes, birds, reptiles, uh, fish bones, 84% cod, flounder, rest. It was just a seasonal, this particular one was seasonal. It was used in the late fall. Um, bottom right, I'm sorry I don't have a scale on it. Does anybody know what those artifacts are? Um, they're odalis. They're cod ear bones. <laughs> I know. And um, th they're not that large. Um, but the cod actually, based on the size of the odalis, we, we determined we're over six feet, sometimes upwards of 200 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Ceramic technology. Uh, uh, we have some great local uh, clay, which was used um, to high fire it, though they had to add temper to make it stronger. Uh, to cook the corn and other um, uh, tubers and, and nuts that had to uh, be done. Some of them were just beautifully decorated. And of course, horticulture. Native gardens, they were, th I love this quote, were small, unfenced, and multi-cropped. Outlines of the planting fields were irregular. Burning the undergrowth created a park-like landscape, one with much less obvious stamp of human activity that we have today. Um, if you want a good book to read, Dr. Kathleen Bragdon, Native People of Southern New England, uh, terrific book. I took that photo up at one of our parks on the ocean. It's there. It's a it's a cactus, a prickly cactus on the beach, and it's the biggest cactus field I've ever seen in my life, um, right here in Massachusetts. Uh, it's endangered on the Harbor Islands, uh, but we have lots of fields. The Algonquin language. Um, the Elliot, we, um, oh, ah, um, 
Ren just mentioned, the, uh, the Bible was first, it was actually first published at Harvard, and it was excavated, the Harvard Yard was excavated 20 years ago, and they found Algonquin print in the archaeological record. So um, it is, uh, Edward Sapir once said, the Algonquin words are like tiny images poems. This is the first uh, dead language that has been um, brought back. And there are actually, there's a school down in Mashpee, and uh, people are be being trained. They're bilingual. Algonquin words often are like the images poems they resemble, uncompromisingly concrete, pointing directly to the heart of each reference being. And, oops, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a, a Roger Williams dictionary. And you can see it. Uh, he actually recorded all of these, these words. So there's a lot of uh, documentary evidence um, that can be used, I in, including some of the um, Victorian histories that I was, I was just sharing with Faris and um, Wren about... Um, specific locational information on indigenous sites. Um, and we're, we're going back and we're using some of that information and some of those old historical maps um, that are assisting us. Contact period, um, Boston Basin was a, a hot spot, important social and political center. Um, Ren mentioned Nana Peshmet. Uh, he lived in the Middlesex Fells. He was killed in the Middlesex Fells by the Tarantines came down, and Squaw Sackham actually took over at that point. We have indigenous plants associated with his homestead in the Middlesex Fells. He, I was telling them that um, he's supposed to be stored at Harvard somewhere. I, so I'm going to follow up on that. Um, but uh, the uh, tr different tribes developed independently of each other based on language distinction, cultural traits, and material traditions. Um, dramatic social, political, and personal upheaval, uh, and the decimation was uh, unbelievable. There was a corridor 15, feet, 15 miles wide between uh, Maine and uh, New Bedford area, the Fall River area, Rhode Island, and it just decimated. Uh, it stopped at the water. It decimated all the villages uh, at that time, and they could not even bury their loved ones. Um, Historic period, I'm not going to talk much longer. Practicing a mobile economy. Um, Wren mentioned um, uh, King Philip's War, uh, internment out on the Harbor Islands. Um, to get out of the internment camps, if you survived, you, uh, most of them sold their land. Um, or they were moved to, sold into slavery uh, and sent down to Bermuda and the Caribbean. And... Uh, then if they did survive, they're involved in sea trades and labor in the 18th and 19th. Th this is what I'm talking about. This, is a, this was sold on Skinner a couple of years ago. Um, the maps, uh, this is an Indian deed. And you can see the names of the... Oh, oh what did I just do? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I get up at four every morning, so I'm like... Um, <laughs> Here are the four uh, signatures of the Native Americans selling this beautiful island, Spectacle Island, which is now the gateway to Boston Harbor. And here it is, Indian deed. So I don't know who bought it, 35, 13,000. I know, and it should have gone back to the tribes. So um, uh, this is a whole another hour. Um, <laughs> But the, so the sovereign status of the Indian nations, this is interesting, predates the formation of the United States. In the 1600s, administrators of some British and Spanish colonies in the Western Hemisphere began negotiating treaties with indigenous tribes. This has accorded tribes a sovereign status equivalent to that of the colonial government. Today, we have lots and lots of regs and laws, but not enough. And I think the, the most uh, important thing tonight I hope to you take with you is that um, they're still here. And here is Ren. Therese, where are you? Is that you? No, I'm not there. Oh, you're not up there. Okay. Um, this great, wonderful group of girls, the history girls down in Quincy at Broadmeadow Schools, uh, were interested in the first people 
uh, of Quincy and single-handedly with Wren and the tribes uh, were able to place signage, change the name actually, they applied to the USGS, changed the name of Broadmeadow uh, to Passnagesset Knoll, to the actual indigenous place name. And this is where Chickatobit and his mom were buried. We don't know um, th if their remains are anywhere near there, but um, and so this is, you know, I say engage more, go to a powwow, if you haven't been to one, celebrate, become a steward, cultivate a steward, read the, the publication Indian Country, um, you can learn a lot and talk to Ren and Faris. So I'd like to introduce Faris at this time. Thanks. Hello, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Well, awesome. <coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Farris Gray. I am the Sagamore of the Massachusetts tribe of Ponkabog. It's an honor to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, the word Massachusetts, for us, it means many from the hills. Um, we say the hills, we're talking about the Blue Hills, which is um, it's a pretty big um, range uh, around here on the coastline. We call it a mountain, but it's really not a mountain. It's not big enough. Um, <laughs> but when you stand on top of the Blue Hills, you can see far. Um, this is a place that was great importance to us. Um, it was the highest feature around. And um, the southern Massachusetts would, um, would communicate through signals with the northern Massachusetts through this hill. Um, when you're up here on the North Shore, you can see, um, at some points, you can see the hills. So um, it was a very important feature for us. Uh, in the south for the for the northern Massachusetts as well. The Massachusetts tribal nation before before the first plagues landed on our shores numbered the tens of thousands from the southern New Hampshire, non Pessimist territory, the northern Massachusetts, to southern Massachusetts, Chickatabas territory, the southern Massachusetts. The Massachusetts Sockums chiefs were all related, descendants from the same common ancestors. Like the English royal lines come from the same ancestry. Some Sockums were brothers while others were cousins. One thing we knew for sure, we were all family. Now Nani Peshmet and uh, Chikataba, um, they were two very powerful Sockums. Um, they both commanded huge areas. Now it's unsure if they were brothers, cousins, but they were kingsmen, they were related, we know that. Um, so when Nani Peshmet died, I'm sure it hit um, Chickatabert Hill hard as well. Prior to the English settlements, the Massachusetts had been trading with the Europeans, the English, French, and Dutch, for over 100 years. During the early part of the 17th century, the Massachusetts were at war, the Corn Wars, with the Abenaki from the north and the Mohawk from the west. Now, the Abenaki are sometimes called the, the Tarantines. Um, just another word for terrorist, I guess, what the French say. Um, but, but they were coming down and raiding the northern Massachusetts quite regularly. There was an ongoing war going on during this time period. Um, it's, it's unclear who started the war, but we do know that um, we went back and forth with them. Nani Peshmet went back and forth with, with the Tarantines. Um, and the Mohawk coming all the way from western Massachusetts and New York is quite a distance to travel. Uh, when we first started our research, we thought that the Mohawk were coming for corn as well, which they were, but what they really wanted to establish was access to the coastline so they can um, trade better. Um, so that makes a lot of sense um, considering uh, the region that they were from. But nonetheless, the Mohawk were actually um, part of the Iroquois Federation. And what we learned is the Mohawk were actually their, their army, the Iroquois army. And so they were a warrior class society. Anybody that watched Star Trek, you know the Klingons, that's what we say the Mohawks were. <laughs> They were like the Klingons, and so um, they were a very formidable foe. Um, and so um, throughout time, and the Mohawks, even after Plymouth was established, we, they were still conducting raids deep into Massachusetts territory, and some of our Sockums, even as late as the 1660s, um, went to war with them. One of our Sockums, Wittawamit, who was the son, not Wittawamit, I'm sorry, um, Wampatuck, who was the son of Chickatabat, 
he led a retaliatory raid against the Mohawk with 600 Massachusetts in 1660. And that's where he was killed um, on the way back from that raid. Um, 600 Massachusetts passed away then. Captain John Smith, who explored the coast from Penobscot to Cape Cod in 1614. Of all these places Smith visited in New England, as he called these lands, he found nowhere more favored than the country of the Massachusetts, which is the paradise of all these parts. The sea coast shows you along large cornfields with great troops of well-proportioned people. Now, uh, to us, this is huge um, to learn these things, um, to know that as um, these European explorers are coming here that they call our territory the paradise of all these parts. Um, it's just a wonder wh what it looked like, like this area, what it looked like. It must have been beautiful, absolutely, because um, John Smith, he's a well-traveled man. He went in a lot of places, and to call the Massachusetts country the paradise of all these parts kind of makes you wonder what it was like here, um, minus all the buildings and stuff. So um, I'm sure if he wrote it as a paradise, it had to be a very nice place. You know, I'm sure anyone here would have loved to go back and see that. The Massachusetts were not simple farmers. We were a masses, master ar agriculturalist. From maize, squash, and beans to nuts, berries, grapes, and surprisingly wild rice, our planted fields were vast, and we spent most of our time during the growing season tending to our fields. The French explorer Samuel D. Champlain wrote, the Massachusetts were too preoccupied with fishing and farming to devote much time to hunting and trapping furs. The French colonies were to be financed via the fur trade. This is the reason the French did not settle Massachusetts territory, because we were farmers. Just imagine, we can all be speaking French right now. <laughs> um, but, but back then, um, the French, they were traveling the coast before the English were. The English were, but mainly fishermen. Uh, now the French, we know up north, where they established um, lots of colonies, to, to find out that the reason why they didn't stay here, because they were here, they didn't stay here, was because we were farmers, because you know, they wanted furs. You know, we, th this whole area is farmland, um, so that, that's what we concentrated on. Um, and um, Champlain also wrote that um, this whole area was devoid of pests. Um, I think he's talking about you know small mammals, rats, anything small which they wanted furs, and maybe not rats, but um, you know beaver furs, things like that, which they found very valuable. There was none here. Um, in fact, you had to go to the wilderness, which they called it, which was inland to find bear and anything of any size, because it. it Thousands of years we're hunting. I mean, we're farming these lands, and you know, animals will kind of eat your crops. So, um, but that was very interesting to find out. From 1616 to 1619, the plagues nearly wiped out the Massachusetts. From northern Massachusetts to southern Massachusetts, there was death. 90% of our population was killed. To put that into perspective, let's say there were 30,000 Massachusetts. That would mean 27,000 were killed. Whole villages lay dead, with none remained to bury their dead. 3,000 remained to tend to the planted fields, even fewer to defend our resources against rival tribes. Whether the plagues were introduced by accident or a calculated campaign, the result was the same. The Europeans had introduced us to hell. Now, that's exactly what it was if you was a native back then. Um, I mean, if you think about it, if all of a sudden all of us started getting sick, your family stopped getting sick, and the plagues, you know, just think how traumatized, how scary that would be, and no one had an answer to what it was, just people were dying. I mean, now we write movies about it, and, um, but back then it was life, and so that had to be devastating not to know what it was. I know up north, uh, the, the Penobscot said that since the French started coming, all their people were dying, so they wanted the French to leave. Um, so who knows what the exact disease was. It could have been a number of things, smallpox, yellow fever, who knows. Um, it was probably all of the above. Um, but we had no immunity to any of the um, diseases that had ravaged Europe hundreds of years before. We had no immunity. And so, uh, but the one thing that um, we, we did ask is, you know, we were trading with Europeans for at least 100 years before this, before the plagues hit. So we always asked that question. Um, why did the plague surface now? 
16, 16 to 16, 19. It's kind of ironic. Right before Plymouth Colony land, that's when the plagues ended, uh, one of the first plagues. Um, so we always ask that question, and it makes us wonder, was it on purpose or was it by accident? Um, but we do believe that it was on purpose. Nani Peshmet and Squaw Sakam. Nani Peshmet was the supreme Sakam of the North Shore before and during the plagues, ruling over a larger area than any other. Many Sakams paid tribute to Nani Peshmet, including some Nitmuk. It wasn't until the plagues killed most of his people in the Abenaki with the help of French muskets that Mish Nani Peshmet fell, finally fell to the Abenaki. He was killed in 1619. Nani Peshmet's wife, Squaw Sakam, and her three sons, Wona Hanakuam, Moto Wampiti and Winupokin took over his, all his territory. Squaw Sakam is a title, not a name, meaning woman leader. There are many reasons why scholars say Squaw Sakam kept her name a secret. The true reason is simple. She didn't want any European to know her name. Life for Squaw Sakam after her husband was killed must have been extremely difficult. With the Abenaki continuously attacking her territory, she saw the English as a powerful ally. But at what cost? Now, Squaw Sakam, um, she was very good at negotiation with the English. She deeded over uh, quite a bit of land, as her sons did. But it was good to have the English here because the Abenaki were continually raiding. So the feud between the Massachusetts and the Abenaki must have been severe because they weren't even satisfied with Nani Peshmet's death. They obviously wanted all of us dead. So whatever happened must have been severe. But Squaw Sakam lived a long time. She didn't succumb to the plagues. Um, so two of her sons did, and the third was disfigured by some plague. Um, but to us, it's, it's a symbol because, you know, the Europeans, they didn't believe in women leaders unless you were the queen. Um, but for us, women leaders were a common thing. Um, when the English came, a lot of times they didn't want to uh, deal with a woman leader with a, a Sakam, a Squaw Sakam. There, are many squ there were many Squaw Sakams. Um, there was Widomo to the south, was very powerful. In fact, as Squaw Sakams go, she was probably more powerful than uh, our own Squaw Sakam up here. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Widomo, but during the King Philip's War, it was her warriors that fought alongside Philip. It wasn't his warriors. He didn't have many. It was Widomo's warriors. And that's why um, she was treated so poorly and they ended up losing that fight because it was it was her warriors took the majority of the, um, the fight. With the onset of the English settlers coming in the early to middle 1620s, you can see exactly what happened to the Massachusetts. From once numerous and prosperous tribe, our territory was being invaded from all sides. It seems like Captain John Smith was correct. The country of the Massachusetts was indeed the paradise of all these parts. Now, like you see with this map, I mean, this is all the same time period while this is happening. Um, you like Abenaki from the north and Moab from the south, and then you had the English coming from the east. Uh, the Massachusetts had nowhere to go. We had to stay. Um, during this time period, when the English started settling, there were many natives who didn't like the Massachusetts because we made friends of the English. Um, but few exceptions of disputes that happen from here and here, here and there. But primarily our Sakums always worked with the English, um, like they had some foresight that the English were going to keep coming. Maybe they did, we don't know. But it seems all of our Sakums worked with the English, granted the English land. Uh, it's kind of crazy how Massachusetts has um, pretty much faded from the history books. There's no mention of them, even after a state's named after them, still no mention of the Massachusetts. So um, it's pretty sad. John Eliot. John Eliot was a preacher who established many praying towns in Massachusetts, the first being Natick, the second being Ponkapok. Eliot, with the help of his Massachusetts interpreter, successfully translated the English Bible, the Geneva Bible, into the Massachusetts language. The Eliot Bible became the first Bible printed in the New World. Eliot created these praying towns in hopes of saving the indigenous from certain extinction. Eliot knew with the thousands of Europeans arriving each year, the Massachusetts 
in surrounding tribes would either be converted to Christianity or be exterminated by the strict English ideals. Now, for us at this time period, um, we really caught, you know, the worst of both worlds. We had um, neighboring tribes raiding us, um, even more so now because now we were living in praying towns. And then you had the English colonists who wanted us exterminated because we were filthy savages. And this is the way we were viewed. Uh, you know, growing up learning about John Elliot, you know, I was kind of like, can't stand that guy, man. Forget John Elliot, right? But learning about him, I mean, if it wasn't for John Elliot and me and my mother, we wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for John Elliot, actually, n no natives would be here. Um, so these praying towns actually saved our lives. Um, and it gave us our language, because we had no written language. So Elliot wrote our language down. So that's awesome that now we have our language. Um, but like I said, during this time period of the praying towns, uh, we were like in the middle. It was the wilderness. Our praying towns were in the wilderness. They, were, they weren't right on the colonies. They was always in the wilderness. And so um, we had um, the rival tribes attacking us, you know, at this time period. Uh, you had natives in and out, in and out. You had Massachusetts coming to the praying town, some staying, some not staying, some leaving. Um, but Elliot traveled not just the Massachusetts territory, he went to Nipmuc territory as well, and he went down to the Wampanoags as well. But uh, he wasn't received as nicely there. Philip's War, I met a comet, King Philip, was from the Poconoga tribe located in the Mount Hope area in present day Rhode Island. In 1675, John Sassamon, an educated Massachusetts, was found murdered by at least three of Metacomet's warriors. The Massachusetts demanded justice. These warriors stood trial in Plymouth, found guilty and hung, thus starting what is known as the King Philip War. This war lasted a little over a year, ended when Massachusetts warriors tracked Metacomet where he, he was killed. So why would the Massachusetts help settlers fight against Metacomet? Metacomet had been for many years selling land to the colonists that was in the Massachusetts Southern Territory. Sassamon was a respected leader for the Massachusetts, and Metacomet was responsible for his murder. Now, Sassamon was from Punkapog. Uh, I don't know how many people here know where Punkapog is, but if you ever drove um, 95, all 95, um, where right, right, it meets 93, right on this Punkapog Trail. Um, that's not all of Punkapog, so Ken. That's just, you know, where a sign where you can read it. Um, but this was, he was found dead in Lakeville. In Lakeville, is um, this south coast, I guess. Um, but it's a beautiful area. It has a bunch of lakes, pretty big lakes. It's a beautiful area. Um, we believe he had family there. But actually, Sasaman was actually friends with Philip. So I don't know how that worked. Uh, but the Massachusetts and Philip had been um, at odds for a long time. In fact, um, Wampatuck who was the son of Chickatabut, and Chickatabut was the Sockham uh, of the southern Massachusetts. Uh, and Metacomet, the son of Massasoit. So it's like an a old feud that passed down from father to sons. And so um, the fact that Sassamon was friends with Philip was it's kind of bizarre. Um, but it was true, and there's some that say that Philip didn't have him killed, that he was friends with Sassamon. And others say that he did because he was jealous of Sassamon because he was quite powerful. He wasn't a Sockham, but he was uh, well-versed and educated, so that made him powerful. That made him able to communicate, and that made him respected in the English community that he was educated. And so, I mean, that was 1675, so that was a long time ago. But um, there were in Massachusetts that were educated at that time. Over the next 100 years, the Massachusetts were continuing assimilated. Even after 100 years of English occupation, the Massachusetts still remained and contributed immensely to the formation of what would become the United States of America. Christmas Attic. Everybody knows who he is, right? Who, in hindsight, had the honor of becoming the first person killed in what would become known as the American Revolution was, in fact, a Massachusetts. 
His father was from African descent and his mother was a Massachusetts from Natick. Crispus was raised in Natick where he was undoubtedly, where he undoubtedly had instilled in him the same Massachusetts values that goes back thousands of years. Now that's, that's another good one for us. I mean, you always like to learn things about your people. Um, and learning learning this, I wasn't an uh, wasn't until I was an adult that I learned this. Um, you know, school they don't they just Christmas addicts, black guy. That's what they say. You know, they don't go into details. It's not until maybe if you you know researching in college, but when you're an adult, you start your own research and you find these things out that his mother was native. She was Massachusetts. And so, the, you know, that adds a lot to the whole big picture of what happened to the Massachusetts. We have always been here. We have always been here. It's just we're not always remembered. And that's pretty sad because we're part of this country. And we're a part of the history here. So it's sad that we're not always remembered, but that's why I'm here today. In the years following the American Revolution, the Massachusetts, who had been living in the old praying towns, were being even more assimilated, moving to bigger cities in search of work. On more than a few occasions, we were burnt out of our homes for refusing to sell our lands. Despite the harsh treatments we received from the Americans, we still contributed, serving in the Revolution, Civil War, Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, Korean War, Vietnam, Iraq, and pres presently serving in Afghanistan. Top right is Thomas Brand Bancroft, who served in the Civil War. In top right center of picture is Alfred Crowd, who served in World War II. Now, to his right, to Alfred's right, on the picture to the right, that is his son, Alfred Crowd III. I believe he uh, also I believe he served in World War II, I believe. Um, there's not much written about them, but th there is a lot written about Ponkapogonetic and about who served and what. You have to dig a little deeper. Most times it's not online. You have to go actually go to these libraries and find them yourself. Um, and so, um, or in, in state archives. Um, but like I said, the Massachusetts didn't disappear. We were just assimilated, blended in. We have family members, uh, some of our ancestors that were burnt out of their homes um, for refusing to sell. We have ancestors whose lands were taken away because they didn't pay taxes, because they said they weren't going to pay taxes. Um, but what happened, it was pretty systematic. Um, first, what was tribal lands that belonged to all? When Europeans came, they divided up into families. And then it was family land. Then after they divided into family, that wasn't good enough. Then it was divided into individuals. And it's then where they sought the taxes. Well, it took a long time for us to assimilate to that. We didn't want to pay nothing. And uh, I'm sure if you couldn't, you wouldn't either. To the left is our tribal seal. We have taken the Massachusetts state seal back. The drawing of the native in the center has always been known to be an Algonquin Indian. Our research has shown that, in fact, it was a Massachusetts warrior. On the state seal, the arrow in his hand is pointed down to show we submit. We have pointed the arrow up to show we now stand strong. We removed the sword above our head. It was common for the colonists to, excuse me, it was common for the colonists to de decapitate us, um, to decapitate our warriors as a sign to other Indians not to resist. We replaced it with the more meaningful word Ponkapok. The sun placed over our right shoulder and the hawk over our left is a reminder to always stay connected. The beads of wampum surrounds us as a symbol to pay tribute. Around the perimeter are the three sisters. Corns, bean, and squash, always grown together. The corn creates a strong base for the beans to grow on, and the squash covers the ground to prevent any unwanted undergrowth. The three sisters were always, the three sisters were a gift from the gods, and we must never forget this. Um, yeah, um, so I think it was four years ago, five years ago, maybe six years ago. Um, that we created this sale 
Um, we haven't heard anything from the Commonwealth yet, so I guess we're all right. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure uh, one of these days we're going to hear something. Um, but with all the talk about changing the state sale, we think this is the perfect thing to do um, to show respect um, and keep it somewhat similar so it doesn't change all that, change all that much. Um, but we are proud of this. Um, it gives us sort of uh, something for people to look at and to see and to identify us with. So uh, that's always good. Today we are more publicly active than we have been over the last century. We speak at schools, colleges, university, and events. We fight for our land, we fight for land preservation, and most of the times going against businesses with deep pockets. We stand up for the equality for all the races. We march, sing, and pray for justice. We have reinvented ourselves. Where there was once sadness and despair, there is now hope and happiness. And that's my lovely mother on the right there. Um, that was at UMass Boston. Um, I think that was this summer. That was this summer uh, where there was a paddle afterwards. Uh, and on the left, that was uh, Columbus Day. And when that was a march to Harvard. Um, that's not just all us there. There's, there's other people there, too. I believe there's Navajo, there's some Penobscot, um, even Abenaki. Yeah, Abenaki, yeah. But they're cool now. Um, <laughs> but, um, it was it was a good day um, for us. It was, there, there was a, it was a long walk though. It was pretty long. We walked um, pretty far, like three miles, so through the city, which feels like forever. Um, so it was a great time. And this look, this is my mother again. Um, this was at Passing the Geese at No, I believe Ellen. You know, she she talked about that. Um, this is the History Girls. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of them. They're awesome. I mean, just kids. They are awesome. They did so much. Um, the story behind the History Girls is. I believe they were in the sixth grade, sixth or seventh grade. Um, their teacher gave them a project to write a brochure for s for some um, tourists that were coming to um, their area. What would they put in the brochure? That's the simple, simple project their teacher gave them. Well, they turned into some huge thing because they did some research and said, "Whoa, look at this history we have here. We didn't even know." So they researched us um, for a school project. And it turned into some big thing, but they got the Corps of Army Engineers, the mayor. They got all these people involved to actually restore this area back to, as close to its original um, state as it could. Um, but it's a beautiful area. And um, the place is really special to us because Pastor Nagy said no was Chickatabit's mother's home village. So uh, now Chickatabit, he's our ancestor. He's not just a Massachusetts. He is one of our ancestors. And so to find that this was a place where he could have been born, depending on the time of year it was. It's huge to us. If it was summertime, planted time, he would have been born here. If it was winter time, he would have been inland further. But it was huge to us. And the story behind um, this place, Pasagisa Noel, is when Squanto um, was helping the English, now the English wanted furs. They wanted bear furs. And there were no bears around here uh, because this was all farmland. And I'm sure we kept them wet bay. But Squanto brought them here to, to pass the geese at Noel, Chickatabit's mother's home village. She had long passed before the English had got here. But on her grave was a bear skin, which the, uh, the Puritans took. And so that created problems for the Massachusetts, and it led into what was called the West Augusta Massacre. I don't know if you've heard of that, but that's another, another time. Um, but that, the history girls are awesome for, for getting past the geese at Noel restored. And this is um, a few of our members. Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the hukulea. Hukulea is a, is a Hawaiian boat. Well, that's not a boat. Don't call it a boat. It's a canoe. You call it a boat to be upset with you. Um, but it's, it's double hulled. It has two hulls. It's a, it's a catamaran. It's beautiful. You can't call it a catamaran either. You've got to call it a canoe. Um, but it's beautiful. And they sailed into Boston. They asked us to escort them to Plymouth, I mean to um, Salem. And so we did, but it was awesome sailing with them. This is us sailing out of um, the Boston Harbor by the islands and all that, but it was an awesome experience. They actually sailed around the globe in this um, to show that their ancestors not only stayed in the area of their island, that they sailed the globe, which, I mean, they did. They sailed the globe. And this, um, this, was a, this is a war canoe. It's a small war canoe. Um, Back in colonial times and before, we had war canoes that could fit over 100 warriors in it. 
Um, so you can imagine how long that canoe was. Um, but this was um, a joint tribal effort was with us in the Nipmuc. Um, this is on the Naponset. And this was this past summer, which was a great time. And that's me. Um, this was um, during one of the fish weirs that we built up in Boston. Um, and we do this, this is a symbolic fish weir. It's not really in the water. Um, but it gives an idea. And kids come and, and they help and they learn a lot about it. And it's an it's a awesome time to spend with community, not just natives, but all the community and children. And here are some of our young. Um, we're cleaning some of our tribal land. Um, we always like to keep them involved, um, especially to learn to honor and, and respect the land, take care of it. Because when we're gone, they have to be there to step up to take care of the land. Uh, because if people aren't there to take care of the land, we all know what will happen. This is our tribal council um, with our Sockum. Um, he's to the right. That's our, um, our main Sockum, this guild. Um, then we have um, then we have uh, that's Working Beaver and Dancing Waters um, and Thomas and me, Robin and his, there's my mother again, and then uh, Alicia. But that's our council. Um, we're the ones who uh, meet regularly. Um, also, some of our board is there as well. And this is our young ones. Um, it's actually my daughter. I had to throw in there. Um, no, but she's um, she's mean. Um, she's <laughs> she is. She's mean. She's she um, she's gonna be a leader one day for sure. Um, she is. De she's definitely got her own mind. She's only two, but the way, I mean, she, the way she's looking right there, that's the way she looks at me all the time. Like, just like that, just mean, just looking at me. Um, she's awesome. <laughs> She's definitely a handful, but that's that's my baby. Um, but that's it for me. Um, that's all I got. Um, anytime anybody wants to meet or talk with me, you have my card. I'm always available. Uh, I could talk about this for hours. This was just a summary. I mean, there's so much information there. I'll be glad to share it at any time with anyone. So thank you.